Welcome to the We Are Libertarians uh, Libertarian Presidential Debate Series. We are talking about criminal justice today. This is a uh, part of a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. Today, I'm joined by Arvin Vora, Ben Letter, and Daniel Berman, and we'll be discussing criminal justice. Uh, you have two minutes to answer the questions. At the end of your allotted time, I'll simply say time, and you must quickly wrap up your thought. You can also finish and yield the remainder of your time. I will ask the question and call on you in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I've designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not necessarily the friendly formats that you might be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I'll be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges that I propose, how well you understand the questions that I ask of you, how well you manage your time, and how compelling your answers are to make all Americans and not just libertarians vote for you. At the end, you'll be giving three minutes to issue a closing statement, which you may use to summarize your feelings on... Uh, criminal justice, challenge an opponent's response to a question, or address an issue that didn't get brought up during the debate. We'll also have a brief 15 to 20 minute uh, recess where we will answer online questions and that will be unformatted. So candidates, here we go. There are three schools of thought that revolve around prisons. The first school states that prisons are meant to punish criminals who break the law and hurt people. The second states that prisons are used to rehabilitate criminals so that they can fit back in with normal society. The third states that restitution should be made during this time to the offended party by the criminal. So that's punishment, rehabilitation, or restitution. Which schools of thought do you most align with? And we will start with Ben Letter. The fourth school? <clears throat> the fourth school of thought. Um... The only logical purpose to put somebody in a cage and lock them away is because you have no other alternative to keep society safe without executing this person. That's it. Nothing good comes out of prison. You think that people get reformed in prison? They don't. They get, they get turned into hard, more hardened criminals. They get more desensitized. And what ends up happening is, and this is where we're at right now, is there's about 30 million people walking around this country with felonies who really, you think libertarians don't like the government. How do you think these folks feel? Myself being one of them, um, nothing, nothing good. No, none of those things that you said are accomplished by the prison system. The only point, the only logical or moral or however you want to look at it <clears throat> is you have a person and it, it, for some reason, it's, it's not worth it to, to execute them. And you need to segregate them from society as if they had some kind of dangerous, deadly disease because they're an endangerment to society. If it's not that, prison doesn't accomplish anything other than cost this country a massive amount of money, create a lot of division, especially along socioeconomic classes. But even, even wealthy people uh, and their kids go to prison, too. Um, it's just disgusting what we've done in this country. <clears throat> we have factories where people are forced to work uh, for far less than minimum wage, if anything at all. Uh, meanwhile, you know, while you're paying that federal inmate 10, 15 cents an hour or whatever, whatever, in, you know, it is there, uh, their, their children are going without the ability to collect child support. So assuming that we had a, a truly dangerous and volatile inmate. Okay. All right. Well, well, we'll keep going with it. Thanks, Odie. Okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, let's turn it over to Arvin Vora. I want to address this first to a lot of the people who are currently in prison unjustly. I'll start with Ross Albrecht. That's a great American tech innovator who is imprisoned as a drug kingpin, and he's imprisoned for life, even though he personally never sold drugs. Now, even if he had sold drugs, I don't think that's a big deal, but he never even sold drugs. He created an online platform. He should be out. He should be creating jobs. He should be creating more innovation but instead he's locked up. When I look at the prison system right now, I'm seeing basically a political tool. Uh, I posted on Facebook a couple of days ago that when Republicans say we need to enforce marijuana laws, what they mean is we need to lock up non-Republican voters so that we can win elections more easily. 
When I see the prison industrial complex right now, I don't see something whose job it is or goal it is to reform society or to improve the lives of anybody, but rather an organization that purely exists to make money, to steal taxpayer money with a little bit of fear and a lot of facile excuses. The actual areas of justice where, where there are legitimate crimes happening, you see a total lack of interest from the police. You see a huge backlog of rape kits where people who have been raped, who have gone through the process of getting that evidence collected are just, they're never responded to, no follow-up is done, and serial rapists just walk free because of that. So when you ask what, what is the, the goal right now of prisons, I, I, I see them as a political and a financial tool and a very ineffective one. I believe that the private sector, the free market should be entirely the only source of any kind of protection and law enforcement. To speak to Ben's point, I don't think that a government prison would achieve that. I think private boundaries, gated communities, private buildings with their own rules would do that. And, and to me, I'm part of the fifth school, which says that, that prisons okay. serve no useful purpose of any kind right now in the United States. All right, well, we got uh, two new schools of thought. Daniel Berman, what do you think? So this is an interesting question. It gets, it can get really philosophical. Um, what we should, you know, at this point, uh, you know, I like to look at it like this. When there's a big problem, we want to get rid of the bulk of the problem before we start getting into the minutia. Um, the number of people in prison who actually deserve to be there might be a, a small percent compared to all the nonviolent offenders that are there. Um, we can talk all day. We can argue until we're blue in the face about what the purpose of prison is for. Um, but the reality is we we have so many innocent people in there that need to be let out. We have so many so many crimes that are felonies that shouldn't be prosecuted. Um, the Cato Institute says that the average American commits three felonies a day. I know I've committed a lot of felonies and I've just never been caught. I have felons working for my campaign who are very good people. Um, you know, the, the idea that, um, you, you know, Ben's very right that the idea that this re rehabilitates people is is not accurate. It's called the, you know, uh, it, we... We trust that the system is supposed to do that, but it doesn't. It's not effective. Does it punish people? Yes, but it also punishes the wrong people. Um, does it pay restitution? Often, no. Sometimes that's included in there, but the government gets more of the restitution than the victim does. And then there's all the victimless crimes. So uh, we need to look at this as, you know, let's take care of the big problem first. Let's go. Let's get all the innocent felons out of prison. Um, these are people who have committed crimes who who haven't hurt anybody. Um, you know, this is this is the biggest cut of of what's costing us. We're paying, I think it's ninety thousand dollars a year to keep somebody in prison times millions of people. It makes absolutely no sense. We need to get these people out of there. We need to do that, and then we can start focusing on okay, what do we do with the people who did commit actual crimes? Do we just want to make the world a safer place by getting them out of society? That's one story. I'm not in favor of executing them because I've seen what the what the government has done in terms of prosecuting the wrong people and, and how far they're willing to go to make sure an innocent person goes to jail for a crime they didn't commit. Just so the prosecutor can say, hey, look, I got a 100 percent score on my on my prosecution rates. All right, kids, thank you so much for your feedback there. We're going to move on to the next questions and actually questions. So due to the relationship between weapons and criminality, we're going to have three questions regarding the Second Amendment. According to recent polling data, the libertarian stance on gun control is the single biggest obst obstacle in reaching to Democrats. Any libertarian will need these voters if they have any hope of winning. How will you message this controversial stance to our left-leaning uh, citizens, compatriots? And we will start the where we left off, Daniel Berman. So it's really interesting that we want to address uh, the those who are left leaning. Um, these are typically the people who want some sort of gun control. But let's you know, it's when you look at what they say they want. I say this all the time: what people say they want versus what they actually want um, is completely different. They say they want gun control, but what they really want is they want to feel safe, and that's perfectly acceptable. That's something that everybody feels. Everybody wants to feel safe. There's a question of if everybody has guns, who's going to protect me? Because a lot of people on the left don't own guns, and they're not the type of people who are. Who are trained to protect themselves and they don't want to be um, as much as as much as people with the Second Amendment say, yeah, I'm going to protect myself. I don't need police. I can protect my own home. There are plenty of people who don't want to do that. I can fix my own plumbing. I choose not to. I hire a plumber. Some people don't want to deal with violent criminals themselves. They want to have somebody to protect them. 
And they don't want those violent criminals to have the tools to use against them. The reality is, and it's unfortunate for people who, who, who believe this way to feel safe, every gun law is unconstitutional. It's, you know, once we start encroaching on the Constitution, well, a lot of your free speech rights, a lot of a lot of the rights that you hold close to you because you're on the left, those are going to go away, too. You're giving an excuse. You're opening Pandora's box to say, hey, um, the right can take away all your rights. They can they can treat you unfairly because you're gay. Um, they can, you know, all these things that they come up with. Um, that's something that we want to avoid. We want to keep your natural rights. Now you want to feel safe. That's completely understandable. Um, and we should make sure that the places that we have are safe. Schools should be safe. And how we do that is not through gun free zones. We have to figure out the right way to do that. But a lot of these problems we're having with school shootings and everything, these are all new and they're all happening in gun free zones. So what we need to recognize is, is banning guns is not the solution. We do need to find the right solution to make everybody safe because that's ultimately what we want. All right. Awesome. Let's move that along to Ben Letter. Daniel just touched on a lot of stuff. Could you repeat that question so I make sure I'm, I'm a- answering your question? Yeah, you bet. Uh, according to recent polling data, the libertarian stance on gun control is the single biggest opti- obstacle in reaching out to Democrats. Any libertarian that needs to win will need these voters. How will you message this controversial stance to left-leaning voters? <clears throat> I don't know if I can give left-leaning voters what they they believe that they want here. I, I don't know if I can do that. I'm I'm a staunch supporter of the Second Amendment. If it if it wasn't for the concept of the Second Amendment that's outlined in in that amendment in the Constitution, we wouldn't have America. We wouldn't be having this debate. Uh, we wouldn't even have the right to vote. Um, and as far as this uh, stripping people of, of, of their right to, uh, to bear arms, that is beyond a, a slippery slope. That, that's exactly how, how you fall into tyranny. Every country that's done that has fallen into a tyrannical regime. So in some cases, uh, lots of people were uh, executed. We all know about these stories. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll add this, you know. This right here is technically not considered a firearm. Anybody can own this, even a felon. A felon can walk into uh, Cabela's or order it online. There's no background check for this. It shoots six rounds. It was used during the Civil War. It killed a lot of people, okay? Anybody can buy that. I think everybody should know that and have the ability to protect themselves, even in a time when the Second Amendment is completely under attack. That's right. better than nothing. It's yeah. maybe not enough. I'm almost done. And maybe not enough to take on a tyrannical government, but it's enough for personal defense. It's something. And everybody should be able to pretend, you know, to protect themselves, whether it's something that they want to do or not. All right. Awesome. And uh, we will finish up with Arvin Vora. Uh, first, Hody, I want to disagree with something you said, which is that the hardest sell for Democrats is the gun position. It's not. It's the government schools position. The position of abolishing government schools, which many in libertarian leadership and even on the LNC have done their best to hide, is the biggest challenge. It is by far bigger than anything related to the Second Amendment. Um, so let me get to the, 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 to the meat of the question, which is how would I sell that to Democrats? I'm not sure that I, that I would. My view on this is if I'm elected, I'm going to pardon every single person who's in jail for a gun charge. If if all they did is a weapons possession charge, I'm pardoning them. As part of my campaign, if I'm the nominee or even if I'm not the nominee, I'm going to do my best to make sure that all Americans know that jury nullification brought freedom of press to America, freedom of press to America, and that today jury nullification can absolutely restore Second Amendment rights in the following way. If you're on a jury, and somebody's there just for a weapons possession charge, say not guilty. It doesn't matter what the law is. You have the right as a juror, no matter what the judge says, you have the right to say not guilty if the law itself is moral. The reason we have a jury of our peers, not a jury of legal experts, is because we want our peers to judge the validity of that law. Now, way to do outreach. You know, a lot of people look at things like silence and say, well, why would you need a silencer if you're not unless you're an assassin? If you are an assassin and you go into a crowded building with a silencer, you will wake up the entire building. 
Silencers are often used out in rural areas where maybe it's Christmas Day, you want to target shoot in your backyard, and you don't want to wake up the neighbors. It's used for politeness much more than it's used for James Bond style assassination. Instead of looking at the Hollywood stereotypes of what these things do, I would want to encourage people to learn what guns actually are, to experience them, to understand what semi-automatic means. You ask most Democrats what a semi-automatic is, they're going to tell you it's a machine gun because they don't understand that semi is part of the word. Automatic and semi-automatic are two different things. And so I would reach out through education, but I would make sure that people know you can nullify these nonsense laws and set people free. Okay. Uh, along the same lines as gun control, do you propose any limits on personal arsenals? Automatic weaponry, silencers, magazine capacity, handheld nuclear missile launchers, death stars pointed at the earth, etc. If so, where is that limit? And if not, why would you not establish a limit? And we are going to start with Daniel Berman. So it's that's an interesting question. We've th there are actually a lot of civilians who own things like tanks and military aircraft already. Um, this isn't really a new concept, and yet you don't see somebody taking their tank to go hold up a liquor store or rob a bank. Um, the reality is these things cost you a lot of money to be able to acquire, and it's it, you know the 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 bad people who do bad things with these types of weapons typically work for the government. People who uh, people who are able to waste other people's money on them. If if I were a private individual and I saved up a lot of money to buy a tank, the reality is. I have a lot to lose by committing a crime with that. Um, this is this is why we don't see these people doing these crimes. But now you have people who are politicians, and if they have access to tanks and they have access to an entire military, of course they commit crimes all around the world, and they have nothing to lose because even if they get caught, it's what's the chances that the U.S. government is going to hold them accountable for a war crime or some other government? That doesn't happen. So really, the, the people who are a danger to be in possession of these types of weapons are the people in our own government. Civilians are not that dangerous because they've got a lot more to lose by abusing those powers. When we see people abusing, uh, uh, abusing weapons like guns and knives, it's because they're very inexpensive. They don't have a lot to lose by getting them. So this is a very important point to keep in, in, in mind when we talk about these things. Okay. Uh, ben Letter, you're next. <clears throat> I, I think all the gun laws should be repealed. And when you're talking about the, the automatic weapons, you know, was that the Federal Firearms Act of uh, 34? Um, all that all that should be repealed. I mean, if you can afford a tank and the ammunition, you, you probably need one. You probably have something to protect um, and you probably have the property to uh, to do it. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that that do, um, and the reality is, is like you never you never see that. Um, just like uh, what Arvin was talking about with the silencers, you how many times have you seen a legitimate murder case that involved a silencer? Not one on television, one of the the you know the hit shows, but an actual. That's not what goes on. Most murders are, are crimes of passion or over some kind of, you know, debts involving, you know, some type of illicit activity that if it wasn't illicit, they could take them to court and handle the debt like every other debt gets handled. Um, you know, we could get into the pie in the sky stuff about the Death Stars and stuff like that. But hey, you know, it, Elon Musk is doing a lot of things in space. And frankly, I have no idea the extent of what what he's up to. Um, what gives him the pass? What's the difference? If, if you can afford this stuff, uh, you're probably an all right person and then you got some stuff to defend and I don't have a, I don't have a problem with it. People like uh, Daniel said, people own tanks and aircraft. You know, they might not sell the, the hellfire missiles and the, you know, all the, all the munitions, but what, what if they did, you know, what if they did? What if we could go to private ranges? What if we all could go to private ranges with our tanks under controlled conditions, private property and all that, and uh, shoot tank rounds and stuff? If we Are we hurting anybody? I, I think not. The military does it all the time. And really, the people should be the military. I believe in the Second Amendment, as in the militia. Um, and I think the militia should have access to these things. Because how do you defend yourself against the tyrannical government? Not just an American tyrannical government, but in this day and age, a global one without modern equipment. Uh, and then we'll close, oddly enough, my random list generator had the same list as last time. So Arvin Vora, once again, close it off. 
Let's ask this question. As an anarchist, I don't believe that we need to have laws for this, but let's ask the moral question. Morally today, most Americans are under direct threat from organizations like the federal government, like the IRS, who are trying to take their money. And that, that theft is immoral. Dan Berman is right. Taxation is theft. And you have the right to protect yourself against theft. And so each person who wants to say, listen, I am not going to stand for this criminal activity. I will not let somebody trample my rights. I will not let somebody violate my rights. And when somebody comes to try to take my money the way that they've told me they were going to do, I'm going to shoot back. The question that you need to ask is what level of firepower would that require? How much firepower would you need to get the IRS to stop? I don't know, I don't know the answer to that question. I assume it's probably a lot. Whatever the answer to that question is, to me is a perfectly reasonable and a perfectly moral and a perfectly logical amount of a firepower for a person to have. We already have laws against murder. You know, laws against the way in which you do murder are absurd. You know, whether you, you know, whether you shoot somebody with a gun or you shoot somebody with an automatic gun or you shoot somebody with a predator drone or you, you know, you dump liquid nitrogen on their head or you dump their face and ass. I mean, there's a lot of normal things you can get to create very horrific killings if that's your goal. The problem is today we have let the absolute worst people get their hands on guns. As, as Ben mentioned, the, I mean, as Dan mentioned, it's the people who, who are using it for wars, who are using it for these unjustified, immoral, absolutely wrong wars. Those are the people we need to take these weapons away from. So the only gun control that I support is gun control on the government, where I want to reduce the amount of weaponry that the government has, to take away all the military weapon from all police departments, all the SWAT teams and whatnot, to shut down foreign military bases, bring the troops home, and to make sure that the U.S. government is not misusing any advanced weapons. All right. Thanks so much. Again, our third and final question about gun control as it pertains to criminal justice. Should people convicted of violent crimes be able to have a weapon so that they can kill others again? Why or why not? And we'll start one more time with Daniel Berman. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, we need to consider, you know, if, if it, it, there's so many ways to look at it. It depends on how violent the crime was. If somebody has shown that they can't be trusted with a weapon, then yeah, I maybe they shouldn't have a weapon. Um, but at the same time, you know, what are what are we doing in our society that's allowing these people to be violent, that's, that's creating violent people, um, that that we're also letting them, you know, walk around amongst us if, if we're so scared that they're a threat. Like Arvin pointed out, if they can't get access to a gun, what else could they have access to? We see all the crimes being committed in, in uh, I guess, all over Europe where guns are banned, where there's, uh, there's acid attacks, there's uh, stabbings, you know, everything. In China, there's, there have been mass stabbings. If a felon comes out of prison and he's not allowed access to a gun, he can still go do a mass stabbing. And is that illegal? Yes, the crime itself is already illegal, just like Arvin said. So the, the way in which you do it and the weapons in which you can accumulate in order to do it again, is, is, it's an interesting conversation. Uh, but the reality is, uh, how many people does that actually affect versus how many people, uh, you know, are we talking about taking, taking away their right to defend themselves? How many people have been wrongly convicted of violent crimes? How many people have been convicted of violent crimes where the crime itself was just a matter of like they got in a, they got in a fist fight at a bar and gave someone a black eye? It was, it was a mutual fight where both people were mutually involved and they both wanted to fight. Um, you know, these types of things are considered violent crimes. And then you have to sit there and say, like, oh, they shouldn't be able to own guns. But it's like a gun had nothing to do with their original crime. They never went out first degree murder to say, I'm going to go murder somebody. Let me go buy a gun and do this. So should they lose the right to defend themselves? Probably not. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's uh, move this time to Arvind Vora. Let's consider how effective banning guns has actually been on banning violence. And I don't want to take this just to the level of Europe. I want to take it to, the le to an area where all guns, all knives, anything that could possibly be used as a weapon is illegal. I'm talking about a maximum security prison. And ask ourselves, has it gotten rid of crime? Is there no more crime in, in maximum security prison? Is there not a, an epidemic of sexual assault happening and other types of assault happening in maximum security prisons? And if it's not going to work there, where you suspend everybody's civil rights, deny them access to anything, including a sharpened toothbrush that could be used as a weapon, 
is that really the way to address this problem? It's not a weapons problem. It's a behavioral problem. It's a cultural problem. It's an economic problem. It's all kinds of problems. It's a psychological problem, but it's just not a weapons problem. So saying that you were in jail for a violent crime and now you can't own a gun is madness. Often, the reason that you were in jail is might have been you might have been defending yourself. That happens. People are there because they were defending themselves. And often they live in areas because they're having difficulties getting a job because they have that felony on their record now. They often might end up living in areas where there is a bit more crime. And now they really need a gun to defend themselves. Maybe before they went to prison, they just need their fists in that bar fight that Dan was talking about. But now they actually urgently, immediately need a weapon. So to me to say that to this man or this woman who their crime technically falls in the realm of violent, uh, it is now no longer able to defend themselves. And they're now forced to live in an area where economically forced to live in an area where the police are basically indifferent. I think that's morally wrong. To me, the Second Amendment is absolute. Every single person has the right to defend themselves. No person has the right to murder somebody, no matter what weapon they use. Let's focus on the actual problem and let's not pretend that this is a weapons problem. All right, Benjamin Letter, your turn to close it off. I like what they had to say. Um, <clears throat> and the only thing I have to add to that um, is this, is that what makes anybody think that someone who may have quote unquote committed a violent crime is not subject to being the victim of a violent crime. When a lot of times, like when Arvin was talking about, let's say women, for instance, they get felonies too, right? They have their firearms right stripped from them too. They move to, you know, these these areas that are really rough. People know that they that they have felonies. They know that they're unarmed. And that makes them that much more vulnerable. Um, and that's a flat fact. And to close it up, you know, I mean, they already kind of touched on, you know, most of what needs to be said, but this needs to be said too. This issue that you brought up, Hody, this is the scam, all right? <clears throat> so you got to think like a scam artist here. What they're trying to do is fear is, is, is a very powerful sales factor, okay? Like you could get, people will buy on fear or sell on fear quicker than they'll do on the, the prospects of profits. They panic. And they have people afraid of the concept of someone who's committed an act of violence before, which uh, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that none of y'all have ever hit anybody in your life. You saints. I bet you're all innocent, aren't you? Uh, you've never been in a fight, never just been a total saint your whole life. Okay, good for you. Most of us, I think, haven't, you know, had that luxury and have had to, uh, get involved in something before, but this is how they, they back people into a corner. They use the fear. So of course, of course it sounds logical. Of course we wouldn't want someone who got into a fight or something uh, at a bar one time. We wouldn't want them to have guns ever again in their life. Thank you guys. I could, I could hear you talk about the second amendment all day. That was great. Uh, but we got to move on talking about criminal justice. So let's really hone in on it. Now the death penalty is the greater sin Killing a person in prison or forcing taxpayers to house, house and feed someone who will never again see the light of freedom. Would you, in an extreme crime, ever advocate for using the death sentence? This will be our only question about capital punishment, so feel free to get out all your feelings on it here. And uh, let's start with Ben Letter. Um, in, in, so, in some cases, uh, I, I, think, I think yes, and I'll, I'll give an example. I think a case of like a, like a major Nidal Hassan, for instance, where we know he is the one that did it. There's no question about it. Um, we all know what he did. Um, I don't think that he's rehabilitatable or releasable. I think if you let him out, he'd do it again. I, I you know, I mean, I, I think that there are some cases like that where there is there is no question you know, of who did this, why they did this, uh, and that they, they would do it again. Um, there are people out there like that. But if it's not a situation like that, if there's Language a of shadow that. of a doubt that this person might have done this, um, and if it's not extreme like that, and, and there's not a dead set intent on, like, this person's going to do it again and again and again, then absolutely not. Um, 
you know, people do change and a lot of times uh, they get the wrong guy and we've seen that happen too often. So what ends up is the, the state, the people, the jury, the, the prosecutors, they're all, they're all really guilty of murder and they never, they never have to answer for their crimes because it was all in the name of justice. Right. You know, so no, I, I typically don't support the death penalty except in, the, in, in a case like uh, the example I provided. All right. Arvind Vora, you're up. I want to answer a parallel question. Would I ever educate a child? Yeah, of course. Would I ever be very careful about what medicines I use? Definitely. Would I ever want to build a house? No question. Would I ever kill somebody? Yes. There are circumstances in which I would kill somebody. But I would never want the state to educate a child I would never want the state to make a medical decision for me. I would never want the state to set up building codes or building methodologies. And I would never want the state to kill somebody because the state does everything wrong. And when they've been allowed to administer the death penalty, they have done it wrong. They have killed innocent people, disproportionately poor minorities, by the way. And as to the argument that it saves, it doesn't save money. It costs more money to execute somebody than to just keep them in jail. The, the economic argument for the state to do it doesn't exist. Now, are there many circumstances in which I would kill somebody? No, no. The, the, the number of circumstances are slim to zero and all extremely bizarre and unlikely. Um, but there is no circumstance of any kind of any level of magnitude where I would allow, want to allow the state to do that. The state has no right to do it. It doesn't have the competence to do it, certainly, but it also does not have the moral authority to do that. Instead, what I would advocate is, to, is for all of us to work on ways to allow the private sector to handle everything, including these crimes. Now, listen, is that an easy thing to think about? Of course not. It's far more complex, but no one could possibly do this worse than what the state has done. That's why I today and continue to oppose a state run death penalty in all of its forms. All right. Thank you. And Daniel Berman, your chance to close it out. So, uh, look, it's a it's a really uh, deep question. There are a lot of ways to look at it. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say, look, some people aren't fit to live. They've done very, very evil crimes and, and they shouldn't be alive. It's, it's understandable to think that way. But we also have to see that this, this is a slippery slope. Look at the, the Fourth Amendment, right? It says pretty clearly in the Constitution that you need a warrant in order to search somebody. But now we have warrantless searches, warrantless wiretaps. There's always an excuse. National security, uh, you know, emergent, um, uh, you know, urgent situations. Um, there, there's always an excuse to just take it a little bit further. And so when you say, OK, well, yeah, this person should be killed because of what they've done. Well, OK, let's let's give them a trial first. And then it becomes like, OK, well, we're, we're 100 percent sure because it was it was a guilty verdict. But what if we're only 95 percent sure? What if we're we're even less and less and less sure? It becomes a slippery slope. And I know you need you need a unanimous decision to, to convict them uh, of a capital crime. But, um, you know, th- what what situation do we say like, OK, well, uh, we don't have enough evidence. I mean, think about the jurors. We don't really have enough evidence, but we're pretty sure he did it. They're guilty. Um, and, you know, this is how we get innocent people convicted. And the fact that that fact alone should be a reason why government shouldn't be killing people. Um, you know, we, here's another thing. People like I know a lot of people who are very much against the death penalty. But then when when they see news of, of a pedophile, they're like, yeah, they need to hang the motherfucker. Like they just get very emotional and all of their their, um, you know, their their preconditioned responses to no, the death penalty is bad. Just go out the window. And now it's a witch hunt. Now it's and they don't even have evidence yet to prove that this guy is is actually guilty of what he said or of what he's accused. And all of a sudden they're they're now running around. It's a it's a it's an angry mob who's going around saying, hey, we got to kill somebody. And this is why we shouldn't have the death penalty, just like the due process laws are there to prevent these people from creating an angry mob and just going out and murdering somebody. The, the, it's there to get to, to go out, uh, create a justice system to bring this person to a court, have a fair trial where emotions are not involved, find out whether or not somebody actually Fine. did it. And the government screws up there too many times. So we shouldn't allow them to have the power to murder people. All right. 
In regards to surveillance programs, a study by Taylor and Francis found it extremely difficult, if not impossible to evaluate, end quote, the harm to privacy in exchange for security. They were, however, able to find multiple instances in the last few years alone of widespread attacks in Europe and the United States that were stopped due to these surveillance programs. How would your administration balance your duty to protect the common defense and your duty to protect citizens' rights? And we will start with Daniel Berman. So this is, to me, this is something that, you know, like they say, never let a good tragedy go to waste. Um, the government is, we've seen so many times, the government hires people to, they snoop on people, they find people who are vulnerable, the people who are, they're, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, not as mentally stable as everybody else. And they pick on these people. They find out maybe they're less educated and they teach them to be terrorists. They sell them, uh, they sell them fake bombs and they tell them where to go and take them to set them off. Then they thwart the case and say, oh my God, look at this terrorist attack that we just stopped. Um, it was your case. Um, the government creates the hatred that makes people want to do these things also. We have to take that all into consideration. And then the government goes around and says, well, if we didn't do all this snooping, we wouldn't be able to stop this. Yeah, but if you didn't sell the guy the bomb, you wouldn't have been able to stop it either. Um, or, or sorry, you wouldn't have needed to stop it. Uh, we have all these, you know, the, the government kind of creates these scenarios so that they can look like the hero. And we need to take those out of the equation when we're considering whether or not this is an actual concern. Something else, you know, to to uh, to consider is that people don't hate me. Terrorists don't hate me. They have no reason to hate me. Who do they hate? They hate the United States government because the United States government has been killing their brothers and sisters and family and children for the past. I don't know how many years. Um, this is the problem. If we stop that problem, we don't have these big issues to worry about. The surveillance net is not going to, you know, it's not going to stop a guy from murdering his wife who just like walked in on her cheating. And, you know, th these are the crimes of passion that, that Ben was talking about earlier. All this mass surveillance is not going to stop that. It stops the big terror attacks, which are not against you and me. They're against the United States government, who is just as guilty in these big international crimes. All right, and uh, Arvin, you're up next. I think Dan is right in that when we consider this, when we consider the actual source of terrorism, it's not from guns. It's not from, from people who hate America because they hate Americans. It's because it's people that we have angered. It's people that we've killed their family. It's people that we have radicalized, for lack of a better word. And the result of all of that is we are basically creating and training our own enemies. My approach to this is very simple. Stop getting involved with other countries' business. Stop sending American troops overseas. Leave NATO and let socialist Europe defend itself. Stop sending weapons uh, or, or military aid to Israel or Saudi Arabia. Stop being involved in both sides of the Syrian conflicts. The result of that is going to be it just simply won't make sense for terrorists to want to attack the United States. Terrorists don't attack places at random. They're not attacking just to attack. They're attacking specifically the places that have set up big intrusive bases on their lands, that have killed their friends and family, that have done their best to antagonize them. And rather than continuing to do that, we need to shut that down. Now, of course, we can pretend and say, listen, if we just spy on enough people, we're going to know who's a terrorist. But there is no test that can look into somebody's heart and mind and let them know and let you know that they're going to snap two or three or four months from now. The level of surveillance required would be astronomical and ineffective, and the damage to privacy done would be limitless. So my position on the Fourth Amendment remains that in order for there to be any surveillance of any kind, you need to have a warrant issued by a judge to surveil that specific person for a specific criminal reason. Walking into an airport is not such a reason. Existing is not such a reason. And until that happens, I will continue to fight against all of these, continue, all of these current laws. Most importantly, I will fight against all warrantless surveillance and I'll work to defund and end the Patriot Act. Benjamin, you get the closing words on this one. 
Well, I'm going to go ahead and recycle a, a, a kind of a, a point that uh, Arvin made in a previous question. Let's talk about a place that has a large amount of surveillance, There's cameras everywhere, uh, guards everywhere. You're, everybody's watching a prison, maximum security prison. And having been there, I can tell you what happens. Uh, the inmates learn how to work around all that uh, because it's none of this stuff actually works. You know, as a business owner, I, I installed a bunch of cameras and stuff like that. And at some point I realized, man, it's a lot of work just watching all this stuff. And for what? Um, all, all that stuff ultimately can be circumvented. Cameras, audio surveillance, uh, electronic surveillance, nothing about electronics is reliable uh, in, in that regard. And all that's really happening here is they're just trying to usher in 1984 or something, you know, like they're doing over there in China with the whole social credit score and, you know, living under camera so that they can have some kind of totalitarian regime. Our freedom and our independence is just as much tied to the Fourth Amendment that, you know, Arvin just laid out. You need a warrant for this stuff uh, upon probable cause. Um, due process. These are concepts that are being lost upon an entire generation. Even within our own party, we've, we've, we've grown, a, have a cultural erosion of due process. We become a society of witch hunters and it's, it's social cannibalism. I'll yield. All right, guys. Great. Uh, let's move along to, uh, the body camera question. So should police be required to wear body cameras? Is this an appropriate use of taxpayer money? If they should, how would you stop the widespread disabling of these cameras at convenient moments? And we will start this time with Arvind Vora. So this goes to that fundamental question of who should be running the police. In the current situation, we have the state running the police by and large, and they have made a total catastrophe of it. Now, interestingly, I recently got to speak at the Libertarian Party of Baltimore, and Baltimore is an area where the police have essentially lost control of things. And so private security has become the norm, both among, for example, the Hasidic Jewish community, private security has become the norm. Among the uh, Johns Hopkins, which is taking over a lot of the areas, buying out a lot of areas, their private security has become the norm. And it's not perfect, and they have problems. And so I would say, Whoever's providing that private security should determine what they need to do in order to best serve their clientele. More often than not, my guess is going to be that, yes, they're going to want to have body cameras. More often than not, I would imagine that every private security firm that's designed to, to police a neighborhood or a residential area, that private company is going to want to have body cameras for a whole variety of reasons. In the current model, we need to throw out the baby and the bathwater. The government-run police isn't working. When it comes to crimes of great horrificness, including rape, they have failed to do anything. Rape evidence kits are just sitting on pub on, on evidence, in evidence lockers. However, while they don't have the wherewithal to test those kits, they can sit around and test urine for drugs all day long. So it's not that they don't have the lab time, they just don't want to use it for anything that makes any sense. When it comes, if you're for something of much less consequence, if you're robbed, if you're burglarized, if something's taken out of your car, whatever, what happens? Do they do anything? No, they just come write a report and you are already using private insurance to cover yourself. We are already trusting private insurance and private security. We are not trusting the police right now. All the police is doing is getting in the way. I would say get rid of them and let the private sector replace it with something that actually caters to our needs and wants. All right, up next, Daniel Berman. So I have a very good friend who was a cop uh, with the Austin Police Department back in the 70s. And he told me uh, that the only time he wanted a video camera uh, not recording him is when he was doing something wrong. He would get accused all the time. It was it was typical, right? Women get arrested and they say, oh, he grabbed me inappropriately. I shouldn't be charged with a crime. They'll say whatever they want to get to get out of this. And this is actually very typical, even when they don't do anything. He wanted that camera rolling all the time to say, look, I didn't do anything inappropriate. It actually helps the police. Why would they turn their cameras off? Because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. 
picture this. Um, what would happen if I got into an altercation with a police officer and I had a bomb body camera, like as if I were a cop watcher, I had a body camera and I were recording the whole thing and then I turned it off and then the cop ended up dead. What would happen? What would that look like? Would it look like, oh, well, you turned off your body camera. That's a little bit strange. And then the cop ended up dead. And I could say, well, he was reaching for his gun and he threatened me. Well, why did you turn your camera off? That seems suspicious, doesn't it? It should work the other way around. Um, I created a website a, a few years ago called accountableauthority.com. And on there, there's a proposed, what I call the Accountable Authority Act, which is a series of bills that would say, look, police officers need to have their cameras running 24 seven, their entire shift, um, eight, 10, 12 hours, whatever it is, they need to record the whole thing, not turn it off and on, not even give them the capacity to turn it off and on. So many of these systems, I've, if you sit there in court and you watch people asking for these videotapes, 80 to 90% of them disappear. I have friends who are criminal defense attorneys and this happens all the time because the systems are flawed and the things that are supposed to wirelessly, wirelessly transmit the video, they get lost. These are massive problems that need to be fixed. And if you don't have the video and something bad happens, you should be held accountable as if you destroyed that evidence on purpose. That needs to be take that needs to be one of your your utmost concerns is making sure that everything is recorded because you're dealing with people's lives and when somebody dies and we've seen police forget to turn off their body cameras and they plant evidence and they murder somebody who's resisting or who's complying, we need to hold them accountable for this and turning off your camera is not an excuse. All right, Ben Letter. Can I have that question one more time, Hody? Yeah, sure. It is. Should police be required to wear body cameras? Is this an appropriate use of taxpayer money? And if they should, how would you stop the widespread disabling of these cameras at convenient moments? Well, the, I, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the police should wear body cameras. Um, and if we're going to have I think we should have insurance. I think law and short enforcement should, should, you know, each one of these officers should probably have to have insurance and, and that be a requirement. Um, because, you know, all the abuse cases that, you know, that uh, Arvin and Daniel just, just covered, um, it's common and it's in our, it's in our news. Um, if you flip the situation around like Daniel did, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make the same sense. It doesn't sound, you know, but people swallow this stuff and, and people just are so quick to go with uh, the cop must be in the right. Um, and that's just often, often not the case because we do see a lot of confirmed cases of, of police that are just basically criminals. Uh, they're not perfect. Um, the, the system of hiring these folks is not perfect. It's not, it's not flawless. And, you know, just like with the, the Miranda rights, when the, the Miranda case came around and they said, well, you got to start reading people these rights when you arrest them and stuff like that. They don't even do that. You know, they're, in today's technology, we should have these cameras and that should be as, as tied to an arrest as, as Miranda rights are supposed to be. And, and you know what? We'll have proof right then and there for the jury that the Miranda rights were actually read because they're, they're often not. All right, guys. Thank you so much for that. Let's uh, let's continue on to the next question here. The drug war, it's beginning to fall apart at the seams. So let's make this broad. What would you, your initiative be for drugs? Do you propose any limits or regulations on recreational or medicinal drugs? If a drug company kills or harms a bunch of people as a result of this new freedom, what would be your response? And we will start with Arvind Vora. I've already pledged that on my first day, I'm going to pardon Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and Ross Albrecht, followed by every single nonviolent drug user, nonviolent drug seller, nonviolent drug trafficker, nonviolent drug kingpin, that's people like Ross Albrecht. And then the primary job that I will have is basically the job of partner in chief, which is if cops arrest somebody for something related to drugs, I'll pardon them. And I encourage everybody else to do the same thing. As, as I mentioned earlier, jury nullification brought freedom of press to the United States. Let's use jury nullification to pardon everyone who is on trial for a victimless crime. There is no reason for such a person to be in jail, whether you're buying or selling or transporting, whatever. So no, I don't put any limits on any kind of drug, recreational, medicinal, whatever. That said, that does put responsibilities on both the buyers and on the sellers. 
as a seller, if you start selling things that kill a lot of people, you're probably going to go out of business. As a buyer, if you don't try to at least put some basic level of thought into what you're buying and using, that's probably going to backfire in unpleasant ways as well. The idea that the government should basically remove that responsibility from both buyers and sellers as it's doing now and then totally mismanage it as it's doing right now is absurd. So in addition to legalizing all drugs, I would also work to abolish the FDA. Americans can figure out what food is safe to eat without the government lying to them about it. Uh, today, the government has basically told us that raw milk, which many health food aficionados go for, is highly dangerous and illegal. However, Cheetos and Coke are totally fine. So they don't need to be involved in this process at all. I would get all government out of all medicine, out of, out of healthcare entirely. And I would make sure, it's in terms of the question of drugs, that no person right. is ever in prison for using, buying, or selling any drug of any kind. All right, Ben Letter. Who in this country can't score illegal drugs tonight? In what city? In what town? In, 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 in what territory? Where's the holdout territory where the drug war has won? They, they, they've still got this little holdout where it's actually drug free. What drug free zone is actually drug free? The prisons? I, I smoked pot in prison. It, it, I, I traded meat packs and stuff like that, ramen noodles for it. Um, it, it every school in America has got drugs in it. This is pointless. This is a charade. This is like saying, yeah, we're going to do something about something that can't be do, done. You know, we're going to we're going to make the sun less hot, you know, or some other ridiculous notion. How the American people were ever sold on this is besides me. It's probably had something to do with that fear stuff I was talking about earlier. It's how they sucker us in all this. Oh, be afraid. You know, we all know about the reefer madness and, and just the propaganda. They, they remember the, this is your brain on drugs, scrambled, whatever. Man, I smoked pot before this debate. If you think I'm an idiot, whatever. Um, waste of money, waste of time. We need to stop. And just like Arvin's been saying, the, one of the best ways to do it is jury nullification. We should make it a life goal bucket list stuff to hang a jury. That should be the new cool thing to do. We need to make that cool. First libertarian that tells me that they were they hung a jury. We need to hear about this. We need to highlight it. We need to brag about it. We need to be writing articles about it. We need to take over the media and start talking about what's really important. If the media keeps doing the job like they did last night during the debates, I think we're well on our way. Uh, I, I'm getting live updates, and I guess it's still going poorly. Uh, so we'll close with Daniel Berman here. So it used to be that if somebody sold a dangerous product to somebody, um, anybody who was harmed by that product could sue for actual damages. Um, if you bought something that was supposed to be safe and it burned your house down, you could sue for, you know, to repair your house. The same thing with, with cars, something malfunctions, the gas pedal gets stuck and you start crashing into stuff. The company itself can be held um, civilly liable for that. We started seeing warning labels on things like irons that say, do not use this on your clothes while you're wearing them. Um, it's not because people are stupid. It's because people have never used these products before and they don't know if they're safe or how to use them. That's fine. So you put warning labels on there, not necessarily because it's required by law, but because you don't want to get sued for selling a dangerous product to somebody who thinks that it's safe for them to use in any way that they can imagine. So the same thing is true with drugs. Of course, there's an exception with drugs because we see that the government actually protects big pharmaceutical companies from selling their drugs and having having to pay for any uh, civil uh, civil lawsuits when their drugs harm people. Uh, I had a I had a friend tell me the other day, hey, you know, you should really watch out for marijuana because I, I had a friend of mine who was smoking marijuana and uh, and he was getting depressed and he ended up in a mental institution because he was trying to kill himself. Well, I asked, was he on any antidepressants? Yes, it turns out he was. He was on antidepressants, the same ones that have suicidal thoughts and suicidal tendencies as the side effects. Mm -hmm. This is the reason he was there. And people still falsely believe that it's marijuana that's, that's making people suicidal. That's not the case. Uh, a lot of the drugs that are out there, the illegal drugs, are not causing as many problems as the big pharmaceuticals that are out there. And these are the ones that are protected by government. That's what we need to look at. And we need to allow people to make their own decisions, make their own informed decisions, 
And we need to allow very consensual, voluntary third party organizations to be able to say, hey, this company's cannabis is safe for you to use. That's what we need to do. It'll just happen on its own if we allow people the freedom to make their own decisions. All right. Uh, next question. Should criminals and people on death row be able to vote? What role do you see a convicted rapist and or murderer playing in the voting system? And we'll start with Ben Letter. What, what is it that we're afraid of here? That uh, 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 50 or 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand rapists are going to take over the country by way of vote from the inside of a, of a prison? That sounds pretty far-fetched. Um, meanwhile, uh, I don't see a lot of, uh, I, first off, I don't see any politicians uh, campaigning on legalizing rape, let's say. That, that'd be a first, that'd be a surprise, and I doubt their campaign would, would go very far. Um, so I doubt there's ever going to be a politician who's campaigning on legalizing rape for the 100,000 or whatever rapists that are in prison to, to vote for and tip an election in the favor of. This is so far-fetched. Denying someone the right to vote uh, is, 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 is the road to tyranny as far as I'm concerned. Because, like, let's look at what happened with, with marijuana. You know, they, they convict millions of people, felonies, marijuana, try to take their right to vote to, away so that they can't vote to legalize marijuana. That's, that's what ends up happening. And then we have patients that are in need of stuff. And, and we all, dude, the cat's out of the bag on this. The government's losing. Even the main parties are having to concede to our ideas. All we have to do is keep firing, keep doing what we're doing. Just don't shut up. All right. Uh, Daniel Berman. So there's this premise that we're going to we're going to weed out some of the bad votes. These people have made bad decisions in life and therefore they're going to make bad decisions on the ballot. Our election system is so screwed up that that these votes are very small in comparison to to some bigger issues. Like Ben was saying, I'm registered to vote in two different states. I could, in theory, go vote for the president twice in different states. That's just how the system is. There's there's nothing illegal with how I got into the state that I'm in. Into, but that's just how it works. Um, you know, so and and it is a good question. What are you afraid of? If there's a prisoner who's sitting on death row, are you afraid that they're going to vote to legalize murder? Is that like, is that even on the table? Or are you afraid that they're going to vote to improve the the due process system that we have, improve the criminal justice system that way that they have? So maybe this person was wrongly convicted and they want to vote for somebody who's going to improve this criminal justice system. Maybe he's going to get executed anyway and we're going to find out 10 years later, hey, he was actually innocent. But maybe he's going to be able to vote for somebody who's going to fight to make sure that the next person doesn't get wrongfully accused and wrongfully convicted of something they didn't do. And, and he might save a life. He might save somebody from getting executed. Um, you know, this is something we have to be considerate of. The government should not have so much power that we're afraid of what a, a, an evil person might do with their vote. There are so many felons out there who have, I'm like I said, I'm a felon and I've done felonious things and I've never been caught. Are you worried about how my vote is going to affect the country? And there are so many other felons out there who have been caught. We've got so we've got hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits sitting on the shelves in, in government uh, storage lockers. All those people are still out there and they could still be voting. Are you worried about their votes? Are you worried they're going to legalize rape? This, you know, the, to worry about a few prisoners is is really, it's missing the point. Okay, two minutes on the button. Good work, and we'll close with Arvin. Let's consider this. We've talked about that if there's ever a circumstance in which you would need to lock somebody up, that circumstance would be if they pose an immediate and significant danger to society, that they're essentially like a rabid dog that needs to be quarantined. The that wouldn't, but even that wouldn't justify taking away their vote. The only time you don't want somebody to vote is if you're concerned that they'll vote for your opponent. And we can see that this has the recent legalization has actually shown this. Um, even states where marijuana has become legal, a lot of people are still locked up for marijuana. And why is that? Because letting them out would certainly tip the votes most likely against the Republican Party in that state, 
but also probably against quite a few establishment Democrats. Within each party would favor the libertarian uh, wings of those parties, for lack of a better word. And it would also certainly favor the libertarian party, which has the strongest, uh, most open and longest standing opposition to marijuana of, of any political organization that I know of. Today, when you take away somebody's vote, that is a political tool. That is not a way to keep society safe. It is not a way to reform a person. It is a way to stop them from voting against you. And the idea that somebody who, has, who is bearing the worst that a government can do, that has been imprisoned by a government, that is, has had their rights taken away from the government, that that person should be prevented from voting against the injustices that are being done specifically to him or specifically to her is absolutely unconscionable. The people who most should be voting are those who are being hurt by the system. If you want to take the vote away from somebody though, I would advise that you take the vote away from every single federal government worker because those are people who are currently voting for higher tax and more money for themselves. But as in terms of felons, absolutely not. Uh -huh. All right, guys. Now, sh uh, would you pass legislation that protected whistleblowers? People exposed corruption often end up also exposing vital security details that put Americans in danger. And how would you distinguish between need to know information and information that puts people in danger when it comes to bringing them to justice? And uh, Arvin, I know you've said uh, things about Assange before, maybe something about keeping him in jail for life, right? But we'll start with you. <laughs> uh, am I first? Yes, you are first. Okay. <laughs> so as, as I've mentioned before, I do want to pardon Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Ross Albrecht. Why is that? Because they are basically working for the American people against the lying and hiding done by the American government. They are heroes. Now, why... Why did WikiLeaks catch on? Is it because the only information that the government was hiding was the specific name of, of one CIA asset somewhere? No, because it revealed large scale negative things that the government was doing. Now, in that process, is it possible that it also may have endangered an asset here and there? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's sad. And I, and I wish that it hadn't done that specific thing. But this is not an organization who, who's spurred by the demand for people to know one small time asset in some tiny country. The reason that it exists is because there's a demand for people to know what kind of immoral behavior the US government is getting up to. If the US government wasn't getting up to that immoral behavior, there'd be simply no interest in WikiLeaks. If there was just an organization that says, hey, you wanna know some minor asset in this small town? Everyone would say, no, I don't care. I don't even care who the president of that country is, let alone some random minor asset in some small town. If you want to stop that, the demand for that type of journalism, there's two things that need to change. First, the government needs to stop doing immoral things. And second, the media needs to actually do some journalism. The, WikiLeaks shouldn't exist. It shouldn't need to exist because CNN and the New York Times and the Washington Post should be doing what WikiLeaks is doing. Snowden shouldn't need to exist because investigators and investigative journalists should be finding that information out and sharing with the American people. That has been what happened historically in the United States. It was journalists that out of the horrible things that the government was doing and they have stopped doing it. Big media is in the pocket of big government and we need to end that. And so would I want to lock up a single whistleblower? Absolutely not. They are protected by the freedom of the press. And I wish the press would do a better job of using their freedom of the press. All right, Ben Letter. Well said, Arvin. Um, you know, I was sitting here thinking while Arvin was saying what he was saying, it's like, what's the big justification here uh, to go after, you know, the whistleblower? And like he said, I think it's because, okay, uh, some, some, some CIA assets were, were compromised. And I got to thinking about this. I was like, you know, the hypocrisy here. We get sold on war, the price of freedom. And we send over people to all kinds of places for all kinds of reasons of which apparently even Tim Ryan doesn't even know why we were in the Middle East. Um, we saw from last night's debate, right? Um, so um, that's what's going on. Yet we can't risk a few CIA agents for the real price of freedom 
to actually know what's going on, to know about the enemy within. Everybody, everybody involved swore an oath to defend this, this country, this constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What about the domestic ones that have rose to power? We were, we were promised last uh, election that people were going to be locked up. I still see those people walking around. Um, I'm tired of being lied to. And those, those Democrat debates, you know, you compare that to what, what you see tonight. There's just no comparing the level of authenticity. They're all a bunch of frauds. Okay. Uh, closing statements uh, on this particular question from Daniel Berman. So we generally look at something like doxing as bad and doxing is just revealing information. It's actual truthful, factual information, but it's, Hey, this person lives at this address so that other people might go and, and do violent crimes against this person. We look at that as a criminal behavior because the intent is we want something bad to happen to somebody else. This is bad. Now, when you look at someone uh, like Edward Snowden, who has a lot of information, and that information potentially includes the names and addresses or pictures of people who might be harmed if this information gets out there, then releasing that information could be seen as, yes, that's bad. We, we, he's, create, he's inciting violence against somebody. But we have to consider, why would he even be at risk to do that? You know, we look at Julian Assange and say, why did he release all this information instead of sifting through it first? Well, if you really look at it, what's going on here is, we need to know that the government is is searching through all of our information. That's not something that by releasing that information, it harms anybody. What that does is it harms the government's illegal programs, and they're very concerned about that, and they're willing to kill to protect those secrets. So if you ask the question, why did they release so much information without sifting through it? There's a concern about how much time they had to be able to actually do this. They have, they ha literally, they're looking over their shoulder to make sure that death is not right behind them from the people that they got this information from. They're trying to protect America by revealing secrets that the government is doing something criminally wrong. If that was not the problem, if they weren't worried about the government hunting them down and killing them, they might have had the time to sift through that information. And if they, if, that threat was not there and they still didn't take the time to do that and they did release the information publicly, then maybe we should look at that as bad as we look at doxing. But until that point, we should look at this as journalism. They are Their main goal was to protect the American people from a tyrannical government. All right, great guys, thank you so much. Fake news has become a headline here in the USA thanks to our president making it a popular phrase. Mainstream viewers on the left and right alike have not shifted their viewing habits away from the biggest offenders who have published outright lies. Should there be slander or libel laws, or should people just be able to publish whatever they want and expect no recourse? And we'll start once again with Arvind Vora. Do I believe that a person should do their best to make sure that the information they receive is true? Absolutely. Do I believe the government should try to do it for them? No because the government is going to call true the things that favor both the government itself and the statist culture that spawns it. Instead, I would say that each of us has a responsibility to be very, very skeptical and very, very critical of all journalism, especially the journalism that is on your side, whatever that may be. If you're a Republican, you have the responsibility to be critical and suspicious of Fox, of Rush, of all the people that most pander to you because you are the most vulnerable to their lies. They're telling you what you want to hear. The other side isn't telling you what you want to hear, so it's easy to be suspicious and skeptical of them. It's hard to be tricked by them. If you're a Democrat, you need to be very suspicious of the things that come out of CNN, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Again, they're telling you what you want to hear, and that's the easiest way to trick somebody. People like us, we need to be especially uh, nervous about people like Cody, who's telling us often what we want to hear, because again, that's a way to be manipulated and tricked. So it's, this is a job of the American people, individuals. Well, the reason we have free press rather than government censors is because we know the government can't be trusted with this. The government lies all the time. It puts out false information. It, it hampers the actual information that needs to get out there. And the major media that's in their pockets follows along. 
it's not just the government that doesn't let the, the libertarians, for example, into presidential debates. That's the CPD, but it's also the New York Times. It's also the Washington Post, all these organizations that refuse to include libertarian candidates in their polls. So no, the government should not be anyone that we rely on in any way. Even if they're just giving advice, don't listen to that advice. Just as the, gov the, the press has a responsibility to report as much as they can, you have a responsibility to try to gauge the authenticity and accuracy of that. And that's a, an individual responsibility, not a government one. All right. Daniel, you're up. So uh, to, to ask if we need another law, the answer is no. Um, but again, these are things that in common law are already illegal. Um, if, if I were to say something bad about you, Hody, um, that I knew to be false and I said it anyway, that would be an actual crime that causes actual damage and was done with intent. Those are the two main things that we look at whenever, whenever a crime is committed without having to have a prescribed law. Whether I write it down or whether I say it verbally, it's still illegal. It creates, uh, it, it negatively affects you. It causes actual damage. This is what we need to look at. When we, you know, as Arvin pointed out, the, the probably the, the biggest uh, producer of fake news is the government, whether it comes from the White House or local branches or anywhere else. Um, you know, they, they send out press releases and all the, all the news organizations just reprint it. Um, whether or not it's true, they don't know because they didn't gather the information themselves. They are trusting that the government gave them truthful information. Unlike us, they trust the government we typically don't. I don't anyway. I, I know America's probably 50-50 on it. But we have to take this all into consideration. We don't need new laws. If anything, what we should have is we should, if, if, if you're interested in the accuracy of news, um, you know, private organizations can, can come up. I, Facebook is already trying to do that. And whether or not their credibility in, in who they select as true or false news um, is up to scrutiny, but other organizations can do the same so that you can go to a list and say, hey, CNN, Fox News, how accurate is the stuff that they're telling us? If they're 80% true news and 10%, 20% false news, we should know that and we should be able to tell us about any news source, whether it's Fox News or some little blog. Uh, that's, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to, it needs to be our own responsibility to figure this out. We can't just give government the responsibility of saying, hey, you're not because then the next thing you know, it's a slippery slope again. And they're going to say, oh, we're going to shut this down. You're not real journalists. You're just a blog. You don't have a right to publish anything. That's what's going to happen. That's where we're going to get. And we absolutely cannot go there. I'm uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with the fact that I ask about fake news and both of the people I've asked so far about it brought me up as an example. <laughs> uh, ben, let her go ahead. You get to close on this one. OK, uh, as far as uh, slander and liable laws, uh, I guess the deeper question there is, you know, can you damage somebody both through those means? Because those are just kind of names to describe how somebody was damaged. And if somebody did one person damages causes damage to another they should be able to seek some kind of remedy for that. But uh, as far as the fake news is concerned, where's the real news at? Uh, Operation Mockingbird. Look it up, folks. The debate's about to be over. Look up Operation Mockingbird. And then I want you to imagine this. That was in a time period where there was just a few spooky little agencies. And, and now we've got uh, dozens of spooky little agencies. And then we also have these kind of these private uh, public uh, spooky agent partnerships going on these days uh you know to kind of circumvent the fourth amendment you know even more um and you know that's what we see kind of going on with you know facebook and some of these companies that are sharing information with the with the government and all that so think of uh you know all kinds of groups of people who have people inside the media that their whole job is to lie to you. Just like, you know, you know, with Don King fights, Hey, you take a fall in the ninth or whatever, or the fixed uh, sports betting. Um, it, it's, it's everywhere. So I've come to the conclusion, as you guys all know, that our only option here is to become the media and to support our independent libertarian uh, media to compete against what is very much a, a controlled information environment. So it's our only option. We have to become the voice. We have to become the press. Um, we, the people, and we have the tools, we have the tools in our hands. Everybody does. And we need to use it while we still can and 
try to take this information that we've all been compiling ever since these little phones and stuff came out, you know, all these police videos, all this corruption stuff. And we need to get into an action phase where we actually do something about that. And if that comes in the form of electing libertarians, you know, then that's that's what I think we need to do. Um, I think people need to act upon this information. We all know the cat's out of the bag. It's time to act. You need to run against these corrupt bastards and you need to vote for libertarians and, you know, other other liberty minded people. All right. Uh, we have three more questions to go that I've I've had planned before we get to the open forum and the and the closed uh, the closing statements. Again, we are taking audience questions. I actually don't have any at the moment. We've got a ton of viewers, so again, if you are if you are viewing and you have a question, feel free to ask on our Facebook feed here. I am checking it, and we'll we'll get to it. Otherwise, we'll just kind of shoot the breeze. But uh, if you've got a criminal justice question you'd like to see these candidates answer we'd love to hear from you all right moving on juvenile detention facilities have come under the microscope due to the horrific conditions and treatment revelations this has reopened the debate about how we treat minors who break laws in this country would you propose any widespread changes to this system should a 14 year old murderer be tried as an adult child case by case how would you see it and we'll start one more time with arvin vora I've written and spoken a lot about the issue of what makes somebody an adult, uh, what makes somebody able to have adult responsibilities. And one of the truly horrific things that I've seen are the ways that sex and violence are treated so differently. We see examples where somebody is who's 18 and you know one day is dating somebody who's 17 and 364 days, uh, one of their parents don't like it and the older person is put in jail as a sex offender and then becomes part of, is on a sex offender registry for life. And that's the way that we're treating, we're saying that somebody who's, you know, 17.9 years old is not an adult. And then at the same time, we have places where they're saying, well, this 16 year old, this 15 year old, this 14 year old, this 12 year old is an adult and needs to be tried as an adult. And that to me, that kind of hypocrisy is ludicrous. It is absurd. And I get the idea that these are difficult discussions and nobody wants to think about the idea of somebody under a certain age having sex. And honestly, sometimes it's easier to think about killing because it's not as emotional for some people in that way. I get that. But that's still a morally bizarre standpoint. And to me, we as libertarians need to really come to terms with what makes an adult an adult. And I don't think it's an age thing. I think it's an ability thing. An adult to me is somebody who does adult things. And adult things are making decisions for yourself. It's providing for yourself. It's having your own job. It's making your own decisions. It's being an adult in a functional sense. That's what makes somebody adult. So, Hody, if somebody is 12 years old, they have their own job, they have their own house, they're providing for their own kids or whatever, and then they go kill somebody, that person is an adult. They are functionally an adult in every possible way. And if somebody is 20 years old and they have some sort of a cognitive impairment, they're essentially mentally a five or six year old, and then they kill somebody, that person is not an adult. This is something where, where the actions and behaviors determine adulthood, not their age. Uh, ben Letter, you're next. <clears throat> well, I've actually been inside these uh, juvenile detention facilities. And... I will tell you guys exactly what they're like. I'll just describe to you my first, you know, my first day. Okay. So day one, right. We're being forced to stand at a modified version of parade rest where we have to hold our heads down in a very uncomfortable uh, manner. They're torture positions. We're forced to stand that way 16 hours a day. Okay. So at some point here, I bring up something called the eighth amendment. Well, guess what? A 15-year-old kid inside of a Texas youth prison is not supposed to be talking about things like the Eighth Amendment. This is when the guard, and I will name him, and I've been waiting to do this for years, JCO3 Washington, had me step outside the view of the camera, slam me to the ground, beat me unconscious. I saw pink every time he, he whacked my head against the concrete, handcuffed me, sent me to what they call security, which is basically the prison within the prison. I don't know where they find these guys that work there, but they're like WWF rejects. I'm not a small guy. These guys are giants, huge, right? In security, they force you to exercise. When I say force you to exercise, a thousand squats is the norm. 
Okay. If you can't do a thousand squats and this isn't, this is inevitable. Inevitably, they're going to break your body down to where you can't do another squat or a push up, and you can't move in your jelly. Right. When you do that, this is what they do to get their jollies. They will claim that you were going to attempt to commit suicide. Use that as justification to go in there, strip your clothes off you, handcuff you and slam you, you know, on every wall in the ground inside of a, a concrete and, and steel room. This is what's going on inside of youth prisons and worse. You think that's bad? Think about what happens to the female youth inmates. Just think about it. It's so stressful that most female inmates don't even have uh, menstrual cycles for months. This is what's going on. And America, you're allowing this to happen. Do something about it. Yeah. Uh, something's got to get looked at. Uh, Daniel Berman. Yeah, I think there are definitely a lot of concerns about what goes on inside of these prisons. Uh, we, you know, we have to look at other things too. We, because we always have the slippery slope program. It's, I mean, that's what the government is. It's a slippery slope for everything. Uh, you know, they they always want to create more laws. They always want to fast track more people into prison. Um, there was a, 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 I guess it was a school that declared at one point that they were going to start charging kids who got in just a regular fist fight on school grounds with a felony. They're now felons. Um, you know, there's, uh, we've, we've seen judges who have been sometimes caught and charged with taking money from private prisons in order to fast track kids through a guilty process to send them off to prison, basically selling kids to these private prisons so they can use them as, as labor. Um, so many ways that this can get corrupt. We absolutely need oversight of what's going on in these prisons. And again, it's just, it's going back to the, to the drug war. There are so many people in prison that, you know, like I said, we got to cut the fat first. Let's look at the big issues. And if you like right now, so many millions of people in so many prisons. Yeah, it's a lot of oversight that we need. But if you get all the people out of prison who don't belong there in the first place, just on on what they were charged with, whether they, you know, even if they are guilty of it, get those people out, then start figuring out who's there, who's wrongfully convicted, get those people out. You start getting a much smaller prison population and it becomes easier to put some actual oversight on these things to make sure that these bad things aren't happening. Um, I mean, we have to we have to consider, you know, if if you if you want um you know, if you want absolute protection uh, for for yourself, you want you want to be able to call the police. Imagine somebody who's in a prison and and not uh, being completely defenseless against uh, prison guards, big people who are trained to use violence uh, to subdue people um, who have weapons and you don't. Imagine what can really go on wrong there. And there's so many possibilities, and that absolutely needs a, a level of oversight that we don't have. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, guys. All right. Private prisons have come under sec under scrutiny due to, due to revelation that their conditions are often worse than public prisons. The capitalist explains that there's no competition in the industry, which results in this kind of lack of difference between a public and a private prison. But how do prisons compete in an open market without incentivizing extended lockups and additional criminals? Wouldn't good prison systems go out of business? And we'll start where we left off with Daniel Berman. So, yeah, that's a great question, because typically libertarians will advocate for everything to be private. Every government organization should be replaced by something private. Um, and we look at private prisons and that's a complete disaster. But we have to look at like what allows them to take a person and lock them up. What allows, a, let's say I want to start a company and I, I want to make it a prison and I want to go around collecting people to put this in this prison. Isn't that kidnapping? Doesn't there have to be some process in order for that to happen? And isn't that a criminal justice process? Um, you know, we trust the government to be kind of like the, the sole source of, the, of a moral authority to decide what's right and wrong, who's good, who's bad, and who should be in prison and who shouldn't be. And yet that whole system is screwed up. And these private prisons are basically saying, well, hey, uh, we have no liability in the cause. If we have innocent people in here, it's not our fault. It's the government because they sent them our way. And we really have to look at that because we're basically taking a corrupt system, a system that's that's known for, for prosecuting people unjustly and taking them and saying, hey, you're a bad person. We're going to stick you in a prison. It is not the private prison. Of course, they have incentives where they might be bribing judges, as we talked about before. But if we didn't have such a corrupt system of criminal justice, there wouldn't be the possibility for that to happen. If a corporation were just if, if 
you know, some corporation were just walking around picking people up and sticking them in a prison. Uh, believe me, the, the, you know, the same people who stood up at the Bundy ranch and said, Hey, you're not going to take this property. You're not going to come in and do this. Those same people would go to that prison and they would shut that prison down. But it's the government who stands behind it and says, no, this is, we have the moral authority. This one decides that this one should exist and all the right people are in there. That's the problem. All right. Let's uh, next up Arvind Vora. When we look at what private means, it's important to really understand that private doesn't mean crony capitalist. Private means entirely independent of the government. I am a strong opponent of government schools, and I'm an equally strong opponent of any government funded schools. To me, government schools are taking money by force and using it for something you might not want to. And charter schools are the same, and vouchers are the same. Government, government run and government funded to me, are not in any significant way morally different. If you want to see what private prisons look like, you don't, you're not going to see that. You're going to see what private law enforcement looks like. And to be even more clear, you're going to see what private dispute resolution looks like. And we've all experienced that. We experience it and it's so painless and it's so automatic and it's so you don't have to think about it that we forget this amazing thing that we're dealing with. You get into a dispute with somebody who sold you something. And do you go to court? No. Do you go shoot them up? No. Do you get into a physical fight? No. You go to Amazon, you pick your reason from a drop down menu, and they send you a mailing label. That's the private sector of, of law enforcement. That's the private sector of dispute resolution. That's what the free market is. The free market doesn't look in any way like the forced market because good ideas don't require force. And good ideas don't look anything like forced ideas, but they'll often achieve the same goals. The goal for, is often, how can we deal with this dispute between these two parties? And Amazon, eBay, Visa, all these people have found ways to dispute, handle almost immediately dispute between parties across the country or even in different countries. That's how private the private free market really looks. Private prisons, it's the same thing as public prison. It's government run, government funded. Just because a private organization is, is quote, running it, it doesn't change one thing. And I would end okay. both public and private prisons and let the private sector, the free market, provide real free market protection. All right, Ben Letter, you get to close on this. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about what a scam this is. This whole private prison concept is actually pretty new. It's a few decades old. Some uh, politicians out of Tennessee came up with it. There's a company called CCA. They, they changed their name to like Core Civic or something to erode all the bad press. I, I was in a CCA facility uh, when uh, before uh, they changed their name to Core Civic. Th these companies are traded on the, the stock market. They're publicly traded stocks. Um, and Arvin is absolutely right. This is not capitalism. This is cronyism. Uh, that that they've first off they put forth all these all these laws it's convenient how it all played out like uh, it, it, 1968 is when it became legal for a felon to have a gun and uh, you know the whole drug war and war on drugs and all that and they had a, they had the system primed and ready to just go after people and throw them in these cages and then suck taxpayer money out and put it into these corporations that are basically front operations. So, you know, judges, politicians, uh, sheriffs, all kinds of corrupt individuals who are in on this, that are the shareholder of this, of this company, they're lining their pockets. And not only are they lining their pockets off the like core civic CCA, you know, the, the company itself, but then the vendors for that company, the people who s sell the commissary, uh, you know, and, and supply all the goods, Bob Barker, uh, these, these are all serious insider corrupt deals. Anyone that's been inside of a, a, a private prison knows the game. It's a fraud that's been perpetrated upon the American people. And it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have all these corrupt, immoral uh, uh, laws that the, that the Libertarian Party is, is, is infamous for standing against. You know, we don't get the credit we deserve. And then when the Democrats try to steal one of our ideas, they're celebrated by the media. It's against us. And that's why we're here debating, offering all these other candidates to come debate us and have a real debate where the questions aren't censored. But they won't show. This is it, folks, in the entire country. Your audio. How do your audio is off? 
Audio. Sorry, guys. Uh, last question here before we get to uh, to a little. Uh, sorry, I had an NBC moment there. Uh, last <laughs> question before we get to the open forum here. Uh, prisons are overcrowded. America has the distinction of locking up more of our population than any other country. Yet studies have shown that nonviolent offenders, when released, are far more likely to commit violent crimes. Can you justify putting these risks on the street and just hoping for the best? And we will start with Arvin Vora. Yes. You don't, you don't get to put somebody in prison for something that they might do. I mean, in that sense, men are more likely to commit violent crimes than women. I wouldn't advise that we lock up all men. It would be absurd. And so the fact that somebody who has been brutalized by the government who has been put into the situation by the government and implicitly with every single person who voted for those. If you voted for a Democrat or Republican who supported this kind of behavior, that's also on you. That's something you did. And now to say, well, this person who we brutalized, voters and politicians brutalized, might now be a more hardened criminal, might want to do something violent. No, that, that, that's not an excuse to lock somebody up. If anything, they, they should be immediately set free and, and, and apologized to. Now, one reason that there's an increase in violence is because of these permanent felony records for people who did something that didn't hurt anybody at all, and they sometimes find it harder to get a job. And if you can't get a job, then the chances of you getting involved in something that'll lead to violence is just a little bit higher. So I, don't, I also reject the notion that all the people who've gone to prison for nonviolent things have been turned violent. I think that sometimes the circumstances that they're put into by the state would be more likely to lead any person to violence. I think that's the, the truth of it. So no, I would not, I don't think that's a legitimate argument. Somebody might do violence and we're gonna keep them locked up. That's insane. If you find out somebody is not guilty, you set them free. And if you find out that the crime they did isn't a crime, you set them free, no questions asked. All right, uh, Daniel Berman, you're up next. So I kind of want to add to what Arvin was saying. Um, you know, the, the world is a dangerous place. There are so many things out there that could kill you. Um, so many people drown in swimming pools every year. People get stung by bees or attacked by hippopotamuses or, or eaten by sharks. Um, these are, there are dangers out there, and some of those dangers are people. Um, but until a person has actually committed a crime, they shouldn't, uh, they, they shouldn't be punished for that. Um, you know, we could all be really safe if we were all locked in a prison as individuals. And of course, if we had guards that were nice to us, unlike the ones that the, the criminal justice system has, but if we were all locked in a prison, we wouldn't have to worry about anyone breaking in with, with guns and everything because everyone would just be locked up. Does that sound like a great idea? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, we, 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 sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought there. You're good. Armed guards, bad guys. Beat um, up. yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, I, well, I wanted to add something else to what Arvin said and I totally forgot the other half of what he said. So I'm not going to be able to add to that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, there, there are these dangers out there. We need to protect ourselves. Um, but we can't, we can't hurt people who have not hurt anybody else yet. And that's, that's really an important concept to understand because that's what government's always trying to sell us. Hey, we, we need to do something because these people could do something, but every single person is capable of doing something bad. We shouldn't lock everybody up. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. Thank you so much. And closing, uh, closing statement on this question from Ben Letter. Well, you know what they call youth prisons, you know what they call like uh, some of the facilities, I don't call all of them because some of them are psych facilities, but the, like the one I was at, you know what they call them, they call them gladiator farms. You know why? Because oftentimes the guards basically force the kids to fight each other for entertainment. What do you expect? You're surprised that you, that you, throw, you throw people, kids or, or adults into environments like this where the guards are just flat out brutal, more brutal than anybody I've met on the streets, you know? Um, and, you know, where uh, often, how many cases have we heard about this? You know, you guys have heard about this, you know, it's not like you guys are getting news coverage from the inside of the prisons. This is commonplace. Um, and you're surprised that people are, are more violent after society, you lock them in a cage 
forced them to fight each other, uh, beat them for uh, not being compliant and, and all kinds of things like that. That's a big surprise. Whose fault is this? It's because we as a society, we're, we're doing this and it's stupid. You know, um, why would we be trying to make people violent? That's what's going on inside. It's a, you're baptized in violence. You, you, in order to survive, you have any kind of dignity or respect, you have to be willing to commit an act of violence at the, at, at, without a moment's hesitation um, or else your time's going to be even worse. This is what we are doing. Society, the good, so supposed good guys are perpetrating this. Vote different. Vote libertarian. G get some kind of a change, please. All right, guys. Open forum here. Uh, got only one question here. And man, I wouldn't ask it if, if we had other, other questions. But since it's our one that, that got asked, what do we do about pedophilia, age of consent, government protection of our children. Uh, again, open forum, so any of you guys can answer as much as you'd like. I wouldn't mind stepping in. and. and <laughs> um, you wouldn't. There, it's, so let's, let's put this into some perspective, right? I mean, we have more than one issue at stake here. We have children who are in every possible way children. You know, two, three, four, five-year-old children. Is there any chance that somebody that age could be an adult? No. I mean, they don't have the cognitive ability. There's never been a three-year-old who's started a job or an entrepreneurship program and is functioning as an adult. Now, whose responsibility is that child? That child's responsibility is the parents. And if you don't want your three-year-old going on a date with a 75-year-old, don't drive them to the date. I mean, it is your responsibility as a parent to provide structure and logic and protection for your child. And if and if you can't maintain that level, you're not fit to be a parent. And if somebody is, at that age is violated against their will, they should have the exact same rights and recourse as any rape victim of any age. Uh, somebody who is, is, is treated, who's molested at that age is, is a rape victim. There, there's no, nothing, nothing different between an adult rape victim and a child rape victim at that age. Uh, when you're talking about somebody older, which is where these things actually get trickier and more complicated, I mean, nobody's talking about, you know, five-year-old. People are talking about, well, what if somebody's 14 or 15 or 16 or 17 or 17.999? You know, we have, have right now situations where people will have a picture of themselves when they are younger, like a month later, they get arrested for child porn. That's where we've gotten to right now. So in those areas, I think we need to say that, that an adult is somebody who does adult things. And if somebody is 18 and not an adult because they either have a cognitive disability or they aren't able or willing to provide for themselves, they're a child and that they should be under the protection and guidance of their parents. And if they are 18 or 15 for that matter, and they have a job and they have their own house and, you know, they have their own kids at that point, that person's an adult and should be treated, in my opinion, completely as an adult. Yeah, I, I think there's. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on these arbitrary numbers like, oh, well, if it's somebody under 18, they're a minor and, and nobody should be having sex with them. But it's just a, it's just a number that we've gotten used to because someone along the line said this is the number. Um, you know, what would happen like we see in some states they are trying to change the age of, of well, alcohol used to be 18 in a lot of places. Now it's 21. Um, they want to change uh, different ages for different things. What if somebody come, came along and said, we want to change the age of consent from 18 to 25? Like it, it doesn't make any sense. And now you're going to, now you're going to have that law completely misapplied on other people. You could also look at other States where they could say, Oh, we're going to lower it. And then it's like, wait, these people are too young, but you're saying, Oh, if you have sex with a 14 year old, the law says it's okay. So it's okay. We, we shouldn't really look at things like that way. We, we need, you know, we need to put more common sense into things. We shouldn't just look at some arbitrary number. I mean, think about it like this. Also, there might be a 30 year old person who's, who's got some mental development challenges, who's not capable of giving consent for sex. And if somebody has sex with them, is that statutory rape? No, but technically they might have the mind of an eight year old. Shouldn't that really fit into the same category? Um, but, but no, but it doesn't count because they're, 
physically 30 years old. There's, there's so much more that goes into this than just, you know, some idiot saying, oh, well, we're going to make a law and it's going to be this magic number I came up with. And it's the perfect number because I came up with it and I'm a genius politician. So that's what we should live our lives by. It's like that's how it works right now. And we should put a lot more thought into these systems. We should determine if somebody really was taken advantage of because they have, um, you know, a young mind who wasn't really taught about the dangers of the world. But we should also take into consideration that, like I said before, the world is a dangerous place. If somebody's 30 years old and they were they were never taught, like if they were kept in a secluded life and now they're 30 years old and they don't have the the they were never taught, you know, what is sex about? What is what is this? intimate exchange what is consent they were never taught about these concepts um is this manipulation is this rape those are it's, it's something we should take into consideration and it shouldn't just be some arbitrary number you know i've you know i remember being in youth prison and there were some people in there that uh you know were convicted of of crimes along these lines and you know they had a really hard time in there and so when i got out you know i was like yeah i've never even taken a chance you know um in this area, but I remember people being around my age group, you know, where there were, there were people that were under the age of consent and they were sleeping with people that were over the age of consent. And like, in my mind, I was like, God, these people could go to prison for this. So, you know, I'm super paranoid because I've seen what happens to people. But, you know, the reality was, is the, there was consent and that was legitimate. Um, no matter what the law really said about it. I mean, and like, you know, I remember talking to some some of these these women, you know, years later when they grew up and, you know, yep, 10 years later. Yep. It was totally consensual what they had going on with so and so. Uh, um, so what should be the litmus test? Uh, I'm not sure, you know, but like, uh, you know, rape is rape regardless of what the age is. Right. So during a, 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 a trial or something like that, I, I'm assuming that the elements of the offense were there and, and could be proven. It could be proven. Uh, is it, is it necessary? Cause what I, what I see a lot goes, you know, go down is that this particular category of charge is one of the ones that like is like a most common to frame. There was a kid in there uh, that was there for, you know, had a, having allegedly having his niece, uh, commit fellatio and the kid was innocent dude his his uh, adoptive sister he they lived in a foster home or whatever and this other girl who was the mother of this small child didn't like him and basically used this to get him out of that the house he was arrested for this and then part of getting out of youth prison in this era is like you had to talk about your crime in detail we had to help this kid come up with a story about a crime that was very horrendous that he never actually committed just so he could work his way through the phases and be released before he was 21 years old. Um, Jeez. I've seen people framed on this a lot. What about uh, Arvin? Who was that gun guy uh, down in Texas? It just, it happened. Um, Cody Wilson. Mm -hmm. What's, what's going on there? And Arvin predicted that this was going to be happened to go to, to use, to go after political dissidents and people like Cody Wilson that are that are in, enacting a lot of radical like change via technology. The government doesn't know what to do. He's, he's yeah, the gun. I mean, he's the gun printing guy, stuff right? Stuff everywhere. Yeah, he's the gun printing guy. Okay, and, I was going to say we had him on the show. That's what Arvin was saying like last year. Something that this was is going to be used to go after people. Yeah, gotcha. Well, guys. Uh... I, you guys did such a good job even keeping the format. I've just got you trained so well. And, and if we start our closing statements right now, we're going to end right on time. So let's just go ahead and uh, begin again. Criminal justice closing statements. Take it away, Daniel Berman. So, yeah, there's there's a lot that needs to change. There are so many things wrong with the system. Uh, there are a lot of people in prison that need to be out. We need to change the way that the, the path that people take to get to prison to, to make sure we're not getting so many uh, prisoners who don't deserve to be there. We need to make sure that the due process is served and that innocent people don't end up in prison um, or on death row and executed as, as we've seen so many times. Um, we are not government property. I want to emphasize that again. We have rights. The government cannot just pick us up and sell us into slavery. So much of the criminal justice system is, is smoke and mirrors, especially when you look at um, 
uh, traffic tickets. And you can go on any of my websites and I talk about that all the time, how the traffic courts alone are screwed up. There's, there, It's all smoke and mirrors. They have these fake courts and they use it to manipulate people to feel like they're guilty and they broke a law so they can extort money from them. It's this system that they have that's it's completely terrible. The, the public defenders a lot of times work for the prosecutors. I had a case that was almost dismissed. It was a, it was a misdemeanor traffic case. They almost dismissed it because they lost the paperwork and somebody stood up and said, we really should take this to trial. And he turned around and handed me his card and he was the public defender. He said, if you need help with defending yourself in this case, call me. This is the guy that I would have walked away free if he didn't do that. And this is the guy that's supposed to defend me. The criminal justice is screwed up from top to bottom. It's insane. Uh, go to my website, Berman2020.com. Get on, uh, get all my information. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, everywhere. Um, and, and taxation is theft. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Ben Letter. Around the quarter in, in 2020, uh, the American people are going to have an opportunity to, to vote for a lot of libertarian candidates for offices that could actually do something to change these laws. Legislators, congressmen, senators, uh, how, you know, state house, states and all that stuff. Uh, and you all out there have the opportunity to run and you should. We need to put a man on every one of these corrupt individuals in office right now. 2020 it needs to be a breakout year. If, if anything that you've heard tonight uh, makes sense or appeals to you, uh, get involved. Join this party at, you know, at lp.org uh, uh, slash join. Join. Become a, become a dues-paying member. Become a delegate. Um, Get involved in your in your local party and support your local candidates. That's the only way that we're going to be able to put the brakes on this. The Democrats and the Republicans are not going to do it. And right now, the Libertarian Party is pretty much the only viable hope. You want to talk about viable? The only viable change right now for criminal justice reform, real criminal justice reform, is voting for Libertarians. And after that debate last night, you can't convince me that we're not as good as them or... Uh, that the production quality here isn't isn't as good. That's a charade. Everybody knows that that's a charade. The American people aren't buying it anymore. Now is the time to start sharing this content. This content that comes out from the, uh, Hody and, and and the We Are Libertarians podcast. You know, blast off Johnny Rock. There's so many great libertarian shows out there. It needs to get shared. If we can't take the media and start forcing our stuff to go viral by sharing it and putting it out there, we're not going to win. We have to do all these things in combination. So see you guys in 2020. My website's benletter.com. This was a great, great uh, episode or, or debate. I love you guys. <laughs> you do, buddy. And uh, let's close with Arvind Vora. And, and Hody, how long are our closing statements? You got three minutes. Okay. I want to uh, talk first about this. this the, the basic fact is this. Nothing that I'm going to say is going to convince you if you don't already believe that it is totally immoral, it is totally wrong to lock somebody in prison for something that is not a real crime. If you think that somebody just because they're poor, because they're a minority, because they enjoy themselves differently from the way that you do, because they smoke instead of drink, because they do something that you don't approve of, even though it hurts nobody else, if you don't think it's wrong to lock that person up, I don't know how to convince you of that. I, it's, it goes against the precepts of every religion. It goes against the precepts of every moral philosophy that I know of. And if you are convinced, then it's time for us to act. And the action that we can take right now is by making sure, is making sure that every American knows what jury nullification is, knows that jury nullification brought freedom of, press to the, of, of the press of the United States and that no matter what a judge says, you as a juror have the right to judge the content of the law as well as the facts of the case. If we can get that idea out there, then I promise you we're going to end the drug war. Because we don't need a majority. We just need one in 12 or one in six people on every jury to be willing to hang that jury. I want to take this to one level further, though. I want to talk about the benefits of hanging a jury. You've been to traffic court. You know what it's like. You know, as, ben, as, as Daniel Berman just pointed out, it is a place where you go to get robbed, where they try to make you feel guilty, get you off balance, and take your money. And 
trick you into thinking that you did something wrong when you didn't. You know that you didn't. If, you're, if you've thought about this, you know that you were just robbed. And you've seen how much money traffic courts make. Well, let me tell you this. Criminal courts make even more money. A great activist that I met in New Jersey actually went to small town courts to find out how much those small things, were, small towns were making. It was about $75,000 an hour. And imagine this. Imagine if you hung a jury for 10 hours you'd be taking $750,000 away from the government. If you hung it for a few days, think about how much money you would be taking away from the government. That's what we can do. Our great power, our constitutional power, is that power to hang juries and to say not guilty when a crime isn't really a crime. And I also want to speak to the Libertarian National Committee. At this moment, you've made the bizarre decision to refuse to help organizations like We Are Libertarians and others that are trying to bring forth unfiltered, real libertarian coverage. It's a bad decision. We need to grow our libertarian media. We need to make sure our libertarian message cuts that, not that it gets filtered through the status media, but that it comes in pure and raw. And if you want to learn more about my campaign, please go to votefora.com. If you want to talk about uh, this show getting more coverage, I'll let you go an hour over time if you want. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, Arvind Vora, Benjamin Letter, Daniel Taxation is, the, is Theft Berman. Again, appreciate all three of you guys for your uh, time tonight. We're, uh, we got the environment debate coming up in two weeks. Uh, same channel, We're Libertarians. Be here. It's going to be a good time. Uh, man, I, I ordinarily just try to keep this as to the facts as possible, but based on what we saw out of the Democrats... <laughs> Last night and tonight, and then out of, out of Trump over the last four years, I think it's it's a. I will do everything in my power to make sure more people hear your words because that's, I mean, you guys, that's what people really need to hear right now. It's embarrassing all the other stuff. Thank you again so much for your time. Uh, if you're donating on Patreon, thank you. If you are not, come on, baby, help us out. patreoncom slash uh, libertarians. Join us for the next debate. We look forward to seeing you guys. Until then, keep keep fueling the fires of liberty. <laughs>